Hello everyone. Welcome to Global Express. I'm Nina Gopal. Today we're focusing on uh, several shocking developments in our neighborhood. Uh, this this is particularly interesting because Iran has shed 20 years of an indirect shadow war that it has conducted with its sworn enemy Israel when it rained some 300 missiles and drones on Israeli territory uh, on Saturday night, last Saturday, uh, Saturday that's just gone before. Israel and its close neighbor Jordan and Britain, France and the US helped to shoot down 299 of these missiles and drones. Iran is reported to have given prior warning well in advance of the time and the date of the attack to two intermediaries, uh, Switzerland and Oman. And yes, of the 300 projectiles, only one missile hit its target, an airbase from which Israel had launched the missiles that leveled the Iranian building in the Syrian capital Damascus that actually uh, sparked this uh, retaliatory uh, strike on Israel. Uh, Israel was ready, it was prepared, but its multi-layered defense was breached at this point. So it's interesting that just like Gaza showed Israel up to have, uh, you know, an Achilles uh, spot, so did this. Uh, taking us through the Iran-Israel, uh, you know, blow up, uh, today are two experts on the region, Ambassador Anil Tribuniat, a, di a diplomat for over 30 years. He served as India's ambassador in Jordan and Libya and Malta as deputy head of the mission in Russia and served in the United States as well. He writes extensively on India's foreign policy and works with several think tanks. Thank you, Ambassador, for coming on the show. Thank you so we much. Also have, we also have Dr. Alvait Ningtujan, who focuses on India-Middle East relations, particularly Israel. Israel's ties with Southeast Asia. He's a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute and visiting, visiting faculty at Symbiosis School of International Studies. Welcome, Professor. Good to have you on the show. So my first question is to you, Ambassador. One, an Iran that has always attacked Israel through its many proxies, never a direct confrontation, shed that policy of proxy warfare and launched a very direct and very open attack. So it seems to have rewritten the rules of engagement, so to speak. I mean, as Army Day, uh, the day before yesterday, showed longer range missile, ballistic missiles. It's been called a strategic shift. Uh, and thus far, it's never attacked a U.S. ally uh, so directly. So why now? Was it because it was under pressure from many of its proxies, or was it losing face with people like the Houthis, groups like the Houthis, uh, which operate out of Yemen and have held the Red Sea to ransom? Well, I don't think it was any pressure from Houthis or anyone else, but I think that this was uh, this happened because uh, the Israel also breached. Uh, directly its own sovereignty in terms of attacking the uh, embassy or a consulate, uh, part of the consular section uh, in Damascus. As you know that uh, the embassy territory is treated as the home country's territory. So it is, that's the reason uh, it had to do it. There have been umpteen number of covert operations on both sides, cyber attacks and whatnot. They've been going on forever. Both countries have vowed to be, uh, to destroy the other. That is also mm. very much there. The, the Iranians do not recognize the existence of Israel. They call it Zionist state, which they want to completely demolish. And uh, likewise, they don't like the Americans either. But at the same time, so far, this was serving their purpose well. Despite the sanctions, despite everything, Iran has continued to be strengthened. And as you mentioned, that the breach, breaches into its security happened. Uh, frankly, I feel that the figures that the Americans and the others have given that 299 have been shot down have been contested not by Iranians, by others also, some other people. Oh, really? You mean it was, not, it was much less? It was, it was not in an attack. It was a message uh, that they conveyed. And it was exactly the same thing that they followed. This was like, if you remember, when General Soleimani in Iraq was kill, killed by the Americans, so yes. why are the Ameri why are Iraqis, they conveyed the message to the Americans that we are going to shoot about 20 odd missiles onto your base. Mm. But the intent is not to escalate further, but we have to respond. So Israel mm. every time has responded. Iran has every time responded. 
So this tit for tat business has been going on in the currency that this has been played out. And that is precisely the reason that the Americans have told uh, Israelis that not to react, not to retaliate. Mm. In fact, they will mm. not be with that. That is the main mm. reason. Mm. What they are trying mm. to do is now to bring about some sanctions against, more sanctions against Iran. That's uh, right. Try to yes, castigate it. Uh, but I think that this was obvious that Iran had to, because of its domestic compulsions, react and respond and respond in kind. And that's what yeah. precisely it has done. Yeah. Professor, if I can come to you, uh, I'm quite fascinated by the fact that Jordan, uh, you know, which while openly, you know, expressing its uneasiness, shot down many of the Iranian missiles which were fired over its territory. And Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, uh, which uh, shared the intelligence with the uh, Israelis, refused to allow the use of their airspace to intercept the missiles and drones. So it shows what a dangerous gamble this is for these Gulf countries. I mean, how the Middle East and the Gulf countries are scrambling to basically avoid an escalation. And also, at, at, a, at a point, uh, also refusing to take sides. Uh, do you think that's a correct estimation of where they stand? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nina, for having me again uh, on the show. Uh, that's a very interesting question, I think kind of reflects the, uh, you know, the dynamics of the relationships between different countries in West Asia or the Middle East at the moment. Uh, there has been always a kind of a division amongst the countries in the region. Uh, and we have seen that how it was in the early 90s and how it is right now. It's only in the recent times, particularly from the early 2000s, when there has been some sort of an understanding between Israelis and the, the moderate Arab countries uh, and one of the common factors of this sort of a convergence of interest is Iran. Uh, again, uh, Sir has served in Jordan and knows the dynamics very well. But the Jordanians also have some concerns about what's going on in the region, particularly the kind of the roles of the non-state actors or even the proxies being propped up or supported by countries like Iran. But when you look at the current scenario, uh, the point that you mentioned about uh, the Jordan and shutting down the, the rockets flying over their air, uh, you know, the territorial uh, space, and at the same time, the, sh the kind of a sharing of intelligence by the Saudis, also uh, to me uh, speaks a lot about uh, some sort of a entrenched uh, 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 fear or concern about what the Iranians are really up to in the region also. Mm. Uh, if you see the... Uh, we have talked about in the last seven to eight years, uh, we have begun talking about the kind of a geopolitical realignments in West Asia that has yes. led the convergence of interest between Israel and some of the countries like UAE, Bahrain, and also with Oman, some tacit understanding with Saudi Arabia, uh, apart from their regional uh, economic incentives of uh, having a kind of a cooperation, it's also large, largely to do with the Iranian factor. Uh, so I'm not surprised, uh, and I think this also has again once uh, once again opened up the fault lines that exist uh, in the region, despite uh, a very seemingly sort of a coordination or uh, uh, development that we see vis-a-vis -vis Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia or UAE, despite the reconciliation deal that was signed uh, last year. So I, to me, yeah. uh, to me, I think uh, it is more to do with the non-clarity of what uh, what the Iranians are up to. And at the same time, uh, they would also would not like to lose out on cooperating with the Israelis for various reasons, economic incentives, security incentives, and also many other political diplomatic incentives. Yeah, I mean, and also, you know, the, the Gulf countries did pay a price. I mean, when Iraq invaded Kuwait and then the U.S. stepped in big time, I mean, Kuwait paid a huge price. Uh, and, uh, and the same thing happened when, uh, you know, when, when the U.S. withdrew its troops from Iraq. I mean, it, it, the, the state just collapsed completely. And uh, you had, uh, you know, all kinds of other, you know, resistance groups coming up, uh, you know, creating a lot of problems. So, I mean, the point basically is that the uh, Israel had, and all these Gulf countries had started to rebuild ties with Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and but I think it's a sign, even Saudi Arabia, and I think it's a sign that they knew they couldn't bank completely on the U.S., uh, so the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, U.S. is back now in a very big way. I mean, we'll look at that later. But if I can just go to you, Ambassador, you know the the uh, Saturday strike. Uh, you know, it demonstrated also Iran's 
you know, build up of its conventional military capability. You know, I mean, the the Iranian proxies, with, uh, you know, are you know up and up and running in a, in a very big way. I mean, Lebanon, uh, southern Lebanon, where the Hezbollah are in uh, huge numbers, are creating problems for uh, Israel. And the Houthis are, like I said, holding the Red Sea, although they've been managed to contain the Houthis to a great extent, uh, you know, but it still shows that Iran's military and battlefield capabilities are far uh, higher than uh, anyone had imagined until the Saturday strike. Or do you think that's an exaggeration? That, that estimate? Well, I don't think so. Uh, let me just uh, take from the previous question that Dr. Alvit very clearly uh, mentioned about it. The fact is, the Jordan has a peace treaty like Egypt with uh, Israel. And it is it needs to be a buffer state. But at the same time, and very strategically positioned. Secondly, it also hosts a very big American base in Jordan. Yes. And uh, the Americans have been supplying uh, a lot of armaments and ammunitions from their base to Israel during this war with Israel Hamas. We should also not forget that King Abdullah is the custodian of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem mm. and all the other mm. Christian sites in that. So there is a direct uh, relation. The, the 50 to 60 percent of the population of Jordan is of Palestinian origin, including right. the queen herself. So the most primary thing for Jordan is the resolution of uh, the Palestinian issue. Uh, secondly, another important thing is this Iran-Israel thing was distracting from that very issue particularly. And the reasons everybody understands that this was Netanyahu's idea to drag the Americans back in, which Americans were trying to push them on the Israel, uh, on the Gaza front. So they wanted to bring back the Americans because if there is an attack on Israel or Israel attacks, it gets dragged into it. Americans will be forced to protect it. That is their policy. So this has been one of uh, Netanyahu's very major policy decision in that sense when he attacked the consulate, knowing too well that there will be a response. At the That's same time, yes, at the same time, no other country in the region wants to become a battlefield between Iran and Israel. They are the two major bigger yes. powers. Even though Saudi Arabia is very much uh, most, I would say, buys the maximum amount of arms and the hyper this thing, but we have seen that Houthis have brought them to virtually these. And they were able to, with one simple drones and missiles, they were able to bring down 50% uh, of their, um, uh, you know, production of the oil was stopped during in, that period. In Dharan. Yes. In Dharan. So we have seen all that. Even UAE, you know, they uh, have in Abu Dhabi. Uh, one of the Houthi missiles uh, struck and one of the Indians died actually in that part. So That's I think right. that this is the, secondly, the trust, as you rightly mentioned, in the American uh, being America being a security provider is no longer existing in the region. So mm. all these countries are also working among themselves to find some kind of a modus vivendi. And that's where the Saudi and Iranian deal, which was brokered by Oman, Iraq, China. and then later China, is really uh, the key. So even during this war, all this through this Israel-Hamas war and the Iran's active interest through its proxies, Saudi Arabia and Iran have continued to discuss and talk. So all the messaging that has been going on has been going to the Americans via Oman during this. So it is not mm. that they are not totally in the thing. Secondly, as you mm. mentioned about the Iranians' uh, uh, capabilities, Iran's economy definitely has been in a bad shape because of the sanctions. But this year it has really grown at 5.4%. Its, uh, its oil production has gone back to 1.6 million barrels per day. China is buying all of that. So they, this has been, he, they have been able to scuttle the whole thing. And a new equation that is emerging is Russia, China, and Iran. Uh, that is a, a strong thing that's happening there. So therefore, what we are looking at today is a very, very complicated scenario and a situation which can just go out of hand in no time. And that's the reason that the Western countries want this not to go out of hand and asking Israel to stop uh, at this stage and take some very minimal measure against Iran as a response. But would, uh, would that, uh, that I mean, all, so all, all of it is right now that you're saying bombast. It's basically uh, Israel, Israel uh, saying that it will retaliate at a time of its uh, choosing, but it really hasn't uh, got many options. Although 
they say that Iran doesn't have the uh, drone technology, the iron drone technology can't match the iron drone technology that Israel has, and that it is vulnerable to a missile attack. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, is are its nuclear facilities, uh, you know, um, protected because the Fordrow music uh, nuclear facility is underground, and so are many of the other uh, nuclear facilities. But it has one overground, the one which is called Bonad, which is uh, close to the uh, the closest to Israel. Would Israel, you think, uh, actually attack that or military infrastructure? Would is that is that even being talked about? I feel that it is quite possible that what Israel might do, they will definitely do something. And, you know, mm. because this party is an ultra-rightist party in the power. And if you see their media, the press, that they must react to Iran because uh, they both are, as I said, they, they suffer from this uh, MAD, mutually destructive syndrome and uh, mm. mutually assured That's destruction. Yes, so yeah. they both are. They, they they are like that. Between the both leadership, they are into that uh, mindset and they're not going to give in, irrespective of the damage that's going to come to each one of them. But what you know, you mentioned about uh, Hezbollah and others. Now, Hezbollah is the biggest of all, the most strongest of the army that they have on this. And Hezbollah is created and so clearly, closely positioned. Now, these were the 300 odd uh, projectiles which went across various countries and above various countries mm -hmm. and even reached the Israel were able to penetrate despite the warnings given. Now, imagine mm. these guys are sitting more than 100,000 missiles next door uh, to mm. uh, the, to Israel. So they will create a very major havoc within Israel. So, so far, Hezbollah has been in low-intensity conflict for the simple reason that Iran's critical strategic interests were not challenged. Hamas or Gaza is good to have. But it was not something that was challenging uh, its own existence or its own uh, problem or uh, any issues for that. So therefore, it did not activate fully all these. It just tried to show here and there uh, the Houthis. Oh, so you're, you're, and the... Saying, you're saying that you're saying that Hezbollah was, uh, you know, was definitely a target because I mean, it was definitely there was a war of attrition on the on that Lebanese-Israel border, but not so much Hamas because Hamas was not uh, seen as a threat. No, 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 no. I'm saying Hamas is, no, Hamas is in, in Gaza, Gaza is triple alone. That's so right. there they are so fighting, they were ruling seven. Gaza. Yes. But Hezbollah will be deployed in when the critical strategic interest or existential threat to Iran comes. So that's mm. when you will see in full force when they can give a quite a good beating, actually, in that sense. That's what I'm saying. Can I just add? So that's what would you have to say? Yes, please. Yeah, please I just want to add. Sir has uh, picked, uh, you know, identified quite a few interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, dynamics uh, which is panning out in the region. Uh, if if you look at the Iranian strategic doctrines or stri or any other security uh, strategy, they have been talking a lot about strategic debt, hmm. and this is something which they have been flexing for the last almost 20, 25 years, and particularly after seventy nine when. Uh, particularly after 2001, U.S. Uh, war on terror invasion in uh, 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 Afghanistan, 2003 invasion in Iraq, they have come to some sort of a realization that you know their their enemies are way closer than they had anticipated uh, uh, before these events. So for the longest time, they have been talking about this. Uh, you know, many of the generals or many of the officials uh, keep uh, you know promoting this idea of we have this strategic depth in the region, and. Uh, with that, uh, what uh, what do we mean is that you know they have this proxies in the first place, but you know it remains to be seen how well capable uh, these proxies are in terms of their uh, military capabilities to strike against an enemy like Israel. Is it just nuisance value or really a yes, threat? Yes, that needs to be assessed very, very, uh, very, very uh, minutely. But at the same time, what Sir has mentioned about the capabilities of uh, the Hezbollah are way different from the from any other proxy or groups in the region. And that is something which the Israelis would not want to take a chance, uh, uh, particularly in the current scenario where they are encircled you know, uh, uh, from all the sides. You can see that happening from the Houthi side uh, in, along the Red Sea. Uh, you already, things are not still very bright in Gaza Strip. Uh, you are already, we are already seeing the uh, developments in, 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 uh, in the northern part of Israel. On the top of that, we have seen the strike that happened on Saturday night. 
so it is uh, uh, it is a kind of a full circle for them now you know that something that they would like to prove for the longest time and in terms of the nuclear facilities that was mentioned many of the iranian nuclear sites are deeply concealed but mm. uh, but uh, at the same time the one that you mentioned uh, i think it's in azerbaijan if i'm not wrong it's so, close to azerbaijan yes there could be a you know there's, there's a possibility of uh, the israelis striking that particular facility in order to you know uh, give a signal that you know we have the capabilities and the precision uh, to to carry out this kind of an attack uh, that they could not uh, uh, see already the 7 october attack was a surprise big surprise uh, to uh, many of us uh, for uh, you know for a country like israel not being able to detect what's coming a lot, you know, uh, towards them. That, that, yeah, that was the biggest shock of all. Right. Uh, so uh, now there are two schools of thought, which, uh, which is now, which are uh, very much at loggerheads in, inside Israel. One supporting uh, a retaliatory action against the Iranian facilities deep within Iran, as well as in the regional uh, uh, you know, theater. And on the other side, there is also a group of uh, school of thought saying that, you know, this is not the right time. We should wait for the moment to, so I think it's a, it's I think we are in a very uh, you know complex juncture at this point. Hmm. Yeah, because you know Netanyahu, the prime minister, has has actually rejected calls for restraint quite openly. The U.S., France, the visiting German, British foreign ministers, they've all they've all called for restraint. But you also have Iran's foreign minister, Ibrahim Raisi, warning that even the tiniest invasion will bring a massive and harsh response. So there is. Uh, you know, and I mean, the U.S. I think announcing sanctions may have just been to sort of quiet the uh, Netanyahu government. But is is Israel's army, uh, you know, I mean, is Israel is Israel's army geared to, uh, you know, counter another Iranian aggression? You think? I mean, if if Israel attacks Iran directly, uh, Iran is not going to keep quiet, so it's going to retaliate in some form or the other. So, what are we looking at? You know, what uh, could are we looking at a full scale? Okay, okay. Is that to me or to Ambassador? Uh, um, if you well, can. both of okay. you. I, so I, would you like I to, want to pick both uh, your brains. Right. See, uh, I'll just give very short uh, intervention in this. Uh, first thing is the, uh, the all eyes would be on the nuclear facilities. And I have one more question to throw in: Will Iran receive any help at all from Russia or China? Uh, okay, uh, I'll just take about a minute and so I can come in. Uh, uh, see, with regard to uh, the uh, possibility of Israelis striking against the Iranians, uh, I think it's a matter of time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it would uh, not, they would like to conduct a kind of a strike uh, in order to enhance its deterrence against something which the Iranians have done this time. That, uh, but then let's, we, we, we still need to see how this pans out. But some of the probable targets, of course, are the nuclear facilities. But again, that depends on where, because as we mentioned just a while back, the difficult yeah. the topography of Iran is not something uh, uh, that we can see in other parts of the world. Uh, the, the other one could be the cyber attack. Uh, the cyber yeah. attack could also be one possibility. We have seen in the recent past how the Israelis have ticked off quite a few uh, personalities uh, involved with military planning uh, and uh, and in including some of the hampering some of the activities with regard to uh, their nuclear uh, uh, facilities. When it comes to support, uh, there are already the Washington Post has just reported on 15 of this month about the possibility of the Iranians buying S-400 and uh, Sukhoi-35 fighters. Because mm. if you look at the capabilities of Iran, logistical capabilities, they are, the Air Force is very weak. Uh, mm. uh, the Air Force is very weak, and that's precisely the reason why they have been investing a lot on different kinds of drones and ballistic missiles, and uh, uh, so that they can reach the targets uh, far and wide, all the way to Israel. Uh, China, we will have to see uh, the the relationship. Uh, all of us are still not very clear about the uh, uh, the agreement, twenty five year agreement that they have signed. I yeah, three hundred or four hundred billion. How much of that would be used for military component uh, or military partnerships? Uh, I have done a piece sometime in 2022 about uh, Iran becoming uh, one of the major ex uh, importers of uh, the Chinese arms and ammunition. Uh, but uh, particularly now, uh, from this episode that we had seen on Saturday night, there could be a possibility of, because again, they are no longer being embargoed arms uh, for uh, arms embargo have already been lifted up in October, I think, 2022 or 2021. Uh, 
So uh, there's a possibility of uh, the Chinese and the Iranians you know, strengthening their military security partnership, wherein uh, the defense different trait could also be one of the uh, uh, markers of their relationship. Uh, this is where I would uh, end, and I would request her to come in. Yeah, this. if I can come to Ambassador Binta, go back to that point about bringing the U.S. back into the game. I mean, it could not have been planned. It's just that these series of events have, have sucked the U.S. back into the Middle East, uh, you know, into the quagmire, so to speak. Uh, you know, so, but within uh, Iran, I mean, you, you've lived there, you you understand the way the mentality of the people work. I mean, Iran has got, uh, you know, it's got the uh, the Ayatollahs and it's got the, uh, the, the mindset that, uh, you know, that they have to be, be uh, reigning, uh, you know, uh, sort of leaders of the uh, Islamic world. But there's also ordinary Iranians who do not want war. You know, I mean, especially this current generation, which has fought the, uh, you know, the uh, Islamists, uh, and they, they are very, very uh, anti-war. They want peace with their neighbors. They want a, a proper, you know, lifestyle. What do you have to say? I mean, do you think Iran overreached itself by, with this attack on, uh, on Israel? I mean, it's going to invite... Well, I, I also personally feel that Iran, Iranian leadership uh, is also not very pro-war. You see, mm. today you don't have to go to the real war to fight a war. The wars mm. can be fought in different ways. We are seeing gray zone warfare as one of the cyber warfare is very much going on. And between Iran and uh, Israel, this is not something, this is virtually a daily affair. It has been mm. going yes. on all through. Secondly, yeah. Iran has this unique asymmetric advantage of having these various militia groups where it has a plausible deniability. So it continues, yeah. can can extract much more mileage um, of keeping Israel occupied all through. You see, you can see now, uh, Hamas was really a ragtag militia, which has to a great extent been supported by Netanyahu against the Palestinians themselves, so that the Palestinian movement does not become united. And today it has become like a basmasur for him. So this is a problem. And now, but you see the whole thing. I mean, Israel is the most powerful country in the region. There is no doubt nuclear power. They don't want a nuclear parity with Iran. So at any stage, at any time, they will try every effort so that Iran does not become nuclear. That's it. That's mm. their basic premise on, on which oh. uh, and I Iran yes. says that it will become if it is not provided what it wants, basically access to the Western markets and open sanctions. So that's the thing which almost happened during Obama's time. But Trump again brought it back. So that's why it is the, the problem will continue. On the other hand, I think that um, uh, look at the capacity. I mean, sometimes I feel that the biggest powers with the most powerful armies have not been able to win a single war. Yeah. Israel was able to defeat Iran, Iran, in 1967 in six days, six major armies in the world. Of the, of the region, they defeated Israel yes. convincingly yes. and acquired a lot of territory from all these places. Today, we are in seventh month of the Israel-Hamas war. Hamas is mm. still very much decimated, but live and kicking, and they are negotiating some kind of a peace deal with them, ceasefire deal at the moment. So they are very much there. Hamas, which is supposed to be the weakest of the three, is very much there. You look at Houthis. They have brought down these 27 member uh, militia, uh, I mean, the armed forces of the Arab countries. They were fighting against Houthis since 2015. Eventually, they had to come down to some kind of a discussion with them. 2006, we have seen Hezbollah. And since 2006, Hezbollah has become the real army for the Iranians. So Iranian yeah. influence, like we, have, we can see in Iraq, which the Americans, by that same very invasion, which you mentioned in the very beginning, gave to Iran on a platter, the Iraq, yes. after removal of Saddam Hussein. Today, Absolutely. Uh, Iraq is very much a part of the Iranian consensus. So what we are looking at is that Iran does have this uh, extra advantage over mm. any other country in the region. Plus, the countries, whether it is Arab countries, well, Saudi Arabia, UAE and others, all want to live in peace at the moment. They, they just they don't want great friendship, but at the same time, they want to live in peace with each other. That's something right. they're trying to buy out. Now, yeah, you mentioned yeah. about China. Of course, China has, in this whole thing, in the last seven months, shown that it is not willing to take on the great responsibility. 
So it has uh -huh. not executed itself very creditably in my view. On the mm. other hand, Russia is one country which has, uh, I mean, you know, drone power you mentioned. Today, the biggest drone con power countries are Turkey and Iran. Iranian yeah. drones are being used by the Russians uh, against the Ukrainians. That's right. And, you know, very effectively. Could, very effectively. So uh, this is what they did. I mean, they could travel 1,000 kilometers to uh, Israel. I mean, that's not a joke, frankly. And it will not be that easy even for uh, Israelis to come down and attack everywhere. So doing something covertly is very different. But going into a war in an overt manner means the Arab countries will also get involved. And that means we are looking at a very major disaster uh, in the yeah. region. So I just want to bring in the fact, uh, you know, I was reading up on the number of times that Israel has crossed borders. I mean, it attacked an Iraqi reactor in 1981 and apparently a Syrian nuclear facility in 2001. So it has also attacked a drone base in Iran as recently as 2022. So it's not that, that it didn't happen even recently. I mean, of course, the fact that they bump off nuclear scientists and, uh, you know, anyone who's seen as a threat, like, uh, you know, Qasem Soleimani and so on, is, is, uh, is, is a fact of life. But my question basically is, when, am I, my, when, I was, when you read up on all of this, is, uh, you know, is, is there any backroom channel that is also going on? If, if Iran has actually shared this kind of information with the Oman and, and Geneva, that it is going to attack, and it's like a warning, wouldn't there also have been some kind of a move to pacify uh, Iran and, um, and Israel? Because uh, Qatar has basically come out of the open, the foreign minister yesterday, and he's basically said he's sick, he, he doesn't think he can uh, do anything anymore. He sort of washed his hands over, uh, you know, any move to bring peace to Gaza or, or anything of that sort. Well, even uh, so far, as far as Iran is concerned, I think that uh, the only country that has been very actively uh, working as a facilitator, not a negotiator, uh, that has been Oman, which has been very successful and uh, is considered as an honest interlocutor in the whole region for any mm. conflict and every conflict, mm. uh, whether it was Qatar blockade or uh, even Israel Hamas or Abraham Accords, whatever you talk. So they are, they are the reliable ones. And with Iran, they have excellent relationship. And they have stayed out of these troubles, even between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So they are the ones who have been a real channel. After that, of course, uh, the uh, Swiss embassy, which looks after the interests of the Americans, has been in touch. So the fact that Iranians gave a notice uh, to the Americans sharing the information that this is not our intent. Our in intent is to respond and convey the message. And that's what was the thing. And the matter is... I found that and... quite remarkable, Ambassador. Was, isn't that quite a remarkable development that there has been this kind of conversation going on between the US and Iran? Yes, it has been going on all through. In fact, uh, that is... Uh, it was until a couple of years ago uh, when they were also talking about the nuclear deal once again. I mean, so they've been yes. not talk, they're talk, talking, but at the same time, you know, not through their PR in New York, um, also, the Iranian PR has been the conduit also, as far as I know. So this is, the, the discussions at the diplomatic level are continuing. And that is why we are seeing the fallout. Like, it has taken three, four days. Otherwise, by now, Israel would have attacked. Mm. Uh, you know, if it was not That's for the Americans. But the Americans were very categorical because they knew the end game that Iran was playing. Because they did not want to be dragged into it directly. What What is Iran's end game? No, Iran's endgame is to maintain its regional influence and the power. Hmm. That's the main hmm. thing. It, it, it is a major player. Yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, I would agree with, uh, uh, with, but it's also more about the symbolism which the Iranians are trying to show uh, to the entire region that we are also capable of uh, striking back. Uh, and if you, if, if we all recall the statements coming out from Iran right after the attack, uh, they mentioned that you know this conflict is deemed concluded. Uh, and they haven't used the word Hamas or Gaza Strip. It was mostly to do with what happened and their, uh, you know, territorial sovereignty against the uh, uh, against the Iranian establishment inside Syria. Uh, through that attack, uh, they have been able to convey a message, uh, and this is something which probably they might have wanted to do for the longest time, but not have not got an opportunity to tell the Israelis that you know we are also not sitting idle. 
for any of your uh, uh, you know adventurism in the region, particularly uh, uh, targeting our uh, establishments. So it's a kind of a message and to also reinforce the deterrence once again and and also to uh, tell the uh, the the entire region that you know we are a force to reckon with. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so you know, uh, they have done that in the form of uh, supporting the proxies on the ground. Uh, we have seen developments on the maritime domain uh, where the Houthis are creating all these ruckus uh, along the Red Sea region. And now they are doing it using their conventional capabilities all the way, uh, to, uh, reaching all the way to Israel. So which in a way also says that like we are still not uh, a force that you cannot uh, tick off, but a, a, a player to reckon with. Uh, but that is something which the Israelis, and now it's up to the Israelis how they would want to come back and retaliate, uh, you know, again, to put a point that we are still the superior military power in the region. Uh, well, the cyber warfare that you talked about, they actually attacked uh, infrastructure ranging from petrol stations to exactly. industrial plants, to nuclear facilities. So all of that is an, is an option before Israel. But if I can just get back to uh, one point, you know, we've talked about Oman being the trusted uh, interlocutor, facilitator, whatever. Where does Turkey step? Where, what role does Turkey play in this? And, and Iraq, I mean, the fact that their leader fetched up in uh, Washington uh, just before the Saturday strike, uh, I found that interesting as well. What does the U.S. hope to, does it, is it hoping to build, uh, rebuild its relationship with Iraq, or is Iraq there basically because it's worried about the Kurds, Kurds who have eaten away uh, you know, of their territory in Erbil and, uh, you know, southern Turkey? Well, Turkey and the Iraq relationship is also very complex. Mm. And because these cards are located in several uh, areas in the region with Syria and with the, in Erbil and all that you have mentioned, uh, but they have their own issues with that. But as far as Turkey and Israel, they have their diplomatic relations. They recall their ambassadors a number of times. But this time again, now they have started some sanctions against Israel, so to say. But if you were to see that they are also working together with Israel in Nagorno-Karabakh, with Azerbaijan. Yes. Turkey, Correct. Israel, and they're all working together. So one of the points that could possibly be that uh, from one of those areas next to Azerbaijan, I think it is possible for Israel to do that. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. that is uh, that, that's quite likely. But Turkey mm -hmm. and Iran are pretty close, you know in their relationship. And uh, therefore, uh, the Palestinian cause today, if there are any countries which are really sanguine about it, that is for their own uh, geostrategic reasons, that is Iran and Turkey. Today, they are the only two countries because rest of the countries in the Arab world, as Dr. Albert also mentioned, Abraham Accords and whatnot, and even Saudi Arabia was going to normalize ties. And that's where our IMAC and other things come in. But what I feel is that this was one of the major objectives of the Hamas attacking uh, Israel on that day, terror attacks, uh, basically yes, to right. stop this progress. And yeah, which is right. quite a lot stopped. I mean, I must say it's virtually uh, in the back burner at the moment. That's so true. Just, what uh, about um, Iraq? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Go ahead, Professor. No, it's, it's, I, I think Turkey is a very interesting country again. Uh, but looking at the economic situations right now inside the country and for the last few years, uh, I would doubt the capability of Turkey to play some role in this regard. Uh, in fact, that you know, uh, Sir also mentioned about the very uneven sort of a relationship between Turkey and Israel, particularly after 2010 Mavi Marmara incident uh, uh, in the Mediterranean, which led to the death of uh, nine Turkish uh, mm. uh, 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 passengers on that flotilla, and then you have many other uh, developments thereafter. Uh, the fact that that they have Again, you know, it was in 2022 that they had reconciled the relationship with the Israelis. Uh, that's also last driven by the internal dynamics, particularly how the economy is crumbling. And at the same time, uh, Turkey has been one of the, you know, I think most uh, vocal opponents of uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in, in the last few years. But then they also have agreed to mend the ties with yeah. Saudi Arabia and also with the UAE. And ultimate result, you know, uh, factor was the economic uh, hardship that the country has begun to uh, uh, experience in the last few years. So given the kind of uh, this predicament or difficulty uh, Turkey uh, follow, has uh, at the moment uh, internally, I uh, don't know how much, what kind of a role they could play. 
and uh, mm. we often are aware of the kind of a relationship Turkey shares with uh, Iran uh, for the last uh, many years. So, yeah. Mm. One thing we should remember. Um, this is... you... Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry go ahead. No, one thing we have to also remember is very right about Turkey. Turkey had these ambitions under Erdogan to become a big leader, Islamic leader, whatnot. All those because of the economic problems have really been tempered down to a great extent. It's still, Turkey is also a NATO country. That is one thing yeah. uh, which is very important in that sense. It also has great relations with Russia. You know, yeah. much more so after the uh, the Nagorno Karabakh, they have become far more closer uh, in that. And I I was in Moscow only two days ago. And I've seen it that how uh, the Turkey and uh, you know Russian interests are matching quite a bit there. But what we are, uh, what I see is that most of the Arab countries uh, have told even the Americans that you could not use your, our bases or our airspace against. Yes, Iran. that's so, right. That's so right. That is also true. In fact, so no, none of these. Yeah, the UAE and Saudi the Arabia have, been, have done that. Yes. You very clearly said you can't use our bases. What is the game with Iraq? I mean, Iraq is like a client state of Iran. So uh, is, is America trying to woo uh, Iraq back or create, uh, I mean, it's got one airbase there still functioning. Uh, what is, in, uh, is, or is, it, is it going to use Iraq to pressure Iran, if that is at all possible? Well, as far as I think is, uh, then Professor can take on. Uh, I think that... Uh... The, in Iraq, at the grassroots level, they don't want the American presence. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. And by what the extraterritorial activities the Americans have been doing it, uh, by killing Soleimani or others, that movement has become far more stronger. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the Iran today has a greater control over Iraq is also the gift of the Americans. That's right. So that's I right. think that... Yeah, I think if we see... Well, if we see in the region, one country that slowly has uh, increased Iranian influence is uh, Iraq. Mm. And uh, particularly that has to do with some of the uh, uh, security problems uh, Iraq had to face uh, after ISIS and groups like that came into power. Uh, uh, so uh, even the anti-Israel sentiments uh, have become very strong inside Iraq when there was a wave of normalization between Israel and some of the so-called moderate Sunni countries were going on in 2020. Uh, the Iranians were very vocal, uh, the Iraqis were very vocal in saying that it's not going to be the case with, with Baghdad. So uh, that is something which we really need to keep in mind uh, to see the kind of uh, internal dynamics uh, or stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. So yeah, that's something I would say. So if I can just go to the sanctions now, the US has imposed very uh, punitive sanctions, US and the UK. On, on Iran, uh, would you say that uh, that is enough of a wrap on the knuckles for Iran? I mean, do you think that Joe Biden, the US president has handled this crisis? Uh, you know, I mean, has he been able to, I suppose are just 10 months away and he hasn't been able to get that six week pause in fighting that he's trying to get Israel to agree to, uh, you know, and now there's Damascus and now there's Iran's uh, attack and a possible uh, retaliation. So, I mean, I'd like to get your assessment on whether the U.S. has done enough. I mean, are sanctions going to be enough to hold Iran down, basically? Well, so far, we have seen that the sanctions have had a very limited impact. Uh, mm. Despite the sanctions, I mean, of course, uh, there is a discontent uh, in Iran. We have seen that is for other reasons, essentially. And recently, the economy was under distress, but Chinese have been able to bail it out quite a bit. Then what happened in Afghanistan also helped them a great deal in the Central Asia and other countries. So Iran has been able to manage and, uh, you know, uh, because of the kind of geopolitical games the uh, Russia, China and the U.S. play, uh, there is adequate space for them. I mean, in fact, just for recently, uh, for releasing five of uh, the American prisoners or something, they got $6 billion yield released from the Koreans for their oil. So uh, Iranians have been able to manage better. But on the other end, you have to also see that while they are having these kind of problems, they have been able to also keep their military strength quite intact and have upgraded their capabilities significantly. And uh, that is something that needs to be factored in that sanctions have impacted 
Russia is the most sanctions country today in the world, but their economy is growing at 3.5 percent. They, right. they are in a good spot at the moment. And so alternatives, countries are moving. Similarly, in other Arab countries, and this, they have changed their foreign policy to make it as active policy. They are now more towards East, like India and China mm -hmm. and the markets like Japan and Korea, instead of focusing more on the West. So I think that we have to see that with the kind of evolution that is taking place, which is forced at the moment, kind of disruption that is happening, these countries are trying to find the space to operate rather effectively. We have seen that. Yeah. Okay. So my last question is about India. You know, Iran's leaders are building bridges with Pakistan. Uh, you know, should India be worried? Uh, you know, will it lose traction, uh, you know, on trade with Iran and so on? I mean, we've invested in Chabahar port quite heavily. Uh, and, you know, the, the regional tensions now, uh, which, have, uh, which have thrown up all of these questions, will it affect, uh, you know, in India's uh, oil, uh, you know, imports, exports? Will it affect our trade relations with uh, the Middle East? Where is it going to go? I would, I'd like to hear from both of you on that. Has it well, thrown for, it for us? Well, for me personally, I feel that uh, whichever way you look at it, uh, West Asia is our most important strategic region. And it is also of existential importance for us. Firstly, we depend for 70-80% of our requirements of the crude and uh, gas from the region, energy. So if you get your mm -hmm. energy supplies intact, your growth will continue to happen, number one. Number two, all your trade goes through these choke points where Iran is sitting at the Bab al Mandab or for that matter, Red Sea. Uh, that is so far, it's very important for us. Then you have your 9.5 million Indians. If the war happens in the region, then you don't know what to do with them. And you know, and how you cannot evacuate. 100,000 evacuating people is a very difficult task. I mean, when the war happens here, and That's I've right. this. Yeah, so that is India's uh, biggest challenge, frankly, is, and that's why India wants the stability and security in the region. That's very important. We have already deployed uh, some of our uh, dozen of our ships in the region for the anti piracy and fighting against these Houthi attacks and all that. But at the same time, I think that we are really worried about it. And that's why India is talking, and everybody, like every sane country, wanting that it does not go out of spiral. All right. I think sir has... Professor, uh, could you come in? Yes. I think sir has mentioned very succinctly with regard to our policy vis-a-vis -vis West Asia. Uh, we have seen this development, uh, uh, I think, from the, particularly from 2014 when this government came to power. And this is not to say that nothing had happened before that. But the kind of a visibility, the kind of a political partnerships which had led to quite a few developments, making the overall ties comprehensive that we can see in the last nine, eight to nine years. Uh, because we've strengthened our relationships not just with the, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, yes. but we've so, also done it with Israel. Right. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, this is something which I have spoken uh, in a forum where Sir was also there last year in Delhi, that this is uh, a foreign policy. One of the success stories of the Indian foreign policy is our West Asia policy right now. How we have been able to maneuver the relationships with various countries, notwithstanding the regional fault lines. Uh, but but having said that, uh, as we see more disturbances in the region, it is also going to be problematic for us. And because of the factors Sir has pointed out, the first one is the the profile of the relationship has changed drastically. Uh, it's no longer we are trading in oil and you know gas, but there is also a big two way investments going on between the two sides. That is the economic uh, part of the relationship. Uh, also, the safety of the Indian workers. It's no longer and hundreds and thousands of Indians are investing in things like the golden visa and right. in the UAE. I mean, right. they're investing in property and uh, and Neom is another profit, uh, another you know project that the Indians are very interested in. Exactly, it's also vice versa. You know, the Middle Eastern countries are also looking for investments in our country. Also, at the same That's time, right. the profile of the workforce is also changed. You know, earlier it used to be very menial kind of a jobs like you know the janitors, the malis, or the drivers, the cooks. But now, uh, very white collar sort of uh, skill levels uh, you know, are also moving towards West Asia. So, in the even there is a larger flare up in the region. Again, we will have to uh, ensure that the safety and the security of the Indians have to be intact. And then the developments in the yeah. 
maritime could also be a little bit worrisome for us. While we don't have many sea uh, uh, firing vessels, uh, the Indian origin sea firing vessels, but the larger imports that we get from the region uh, are through the maritime domain. So we have the issue pertaining to the insurance, the time consumption, the fuel charges. So all of them have to be factored in. But um, I would agree in saying that this is a region which holds very important, particularly from the Indian security point of view, energy point of view. And no matter how much we are trying to reverse the utilities on uh, the fossil fuel or the hydrocarbons, uh, the suppliers of West Asian region will continue to remain some of the most important uh, exporters for us. Uh, so you have economic dynamics, uh, you have social cultural dynamics, and at the same time, military security, which is- So can we conclude then with both of you saying then that uh, there will be no huge conflagration between Iran and Israel, or do you see, uh, you know, some kind of a firefight? If I can so have far, concluding the, remarks and interviews. So far, the lid is on, and let's hope it stays on. Huh. So what about said, you, Professor? Yeah, it's a little bit of a volatile because it, uh, to me, it also has, uh, you know, uh, struck at the heart of the Israeli prestige and ego also. Uh, that mm. has been the la uh, the most advanced military power in the region uh, that, you know, that could still uh, lead to some sort of an action in the times to come. But the magnitude, that is something which we need to see in the times to come. Yeah, But I'm sure there will be some sort of an action uh, in this, whether it is deep inside or in any of the uh, other countries where they have their presence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Ambassador Tribunal. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Allwhite. It was Thank wonderful having much. both of you on the show. Thanks so much. Viewers, Thank please click on the Global Express icon and share and retweet. Thank you.